Good morning, church. It's Pastor John here. Well, uh, welcome to our 11 a.m. Uh, EFCA service online. So we're back live streaming from church and not remote live streaming today. So that's a relief. We're glad for the technology that has allowed us to do so. Uh, here there's just a small serving team. We're keeping each other company and we're glad to uh, be in fellowship uh, online uh, across the screens as we uh, can do. Well, this morning we're glad that uh, our old English pastor, Dave Chen, is back to preach for us. And I'm going to uh, interview him in the service to find out a little bit more about what's been happening with him. So it's been great to see him. And uh, these COVID-induced circumstances are all the more reason why he and the family need to join us later on in the year, uh, where we can actually uh, catch up with them more fully face-to-face. And uh, he is keen to catch up with uh, so many of you as well as, of course, uh, you would be keen to uh, catch up with him and the family. So that is uh, great. And today, as Dave preaches from Psalm 44, it's very timely that not only is it our summer series, but the Psalms are actually great at teaching us to be real with God. We're real with God in the feelings that we have, the frustrations, the difficulties. We're very real about expressing those to Him, and turning to Him in faith and trust and dependence and worship. And uh, that is very apt and timely, as uh, we are frustrated and find the COVID situation quite difficult, of course, in many ways. Uh, So we're reminded that we uh, turn to our God in the midst of those, and we're very real with the troubles, the difficulties, the frustrations that we go through. Well, uh, let me begin in prayer as we uh, start our service. Our Heavenly Father, we praise You that You are the God of our salvation. You are the Rock, the Redeemer, our Fortress, our Shield. Thank You that Psalms uh, reminds us of those things, that we are to turn to You in uh, happiness and joy, as well as frustrations, anxieties, troubles and difficulties. And uh, You know so well about all those that are happening because of COVID, the uh, disruptions, the delays... Uh, the ways in which uh, that have uh, uh, been difficult for our current life. Uh, And yet, Lord, you are the one who holds us, sustains us, keeps us, and reminds us of your everlasting goodness to us in our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, let's uh, begin by, uh, in song, remembering and worshipping our God, praising Him. And uh, the band is going to lead us uh, in the online version, so please uh, sing along as uh, we look to our God. Oh, 
Hi, John. Hi, everyone. Dave, it's good to uh, have you back again. Uh, now, Dave, last week uh, that you were with us, you were sharing a little bit about uh, what you've been up to, and uh, what we find intriguing is that I believe that you actually have uh, a few hats that you wear at the moment. Uh, tell us a little bit about that, about study yeah. and work. Yeah, yeah. So, I've um, got a few jobs at the moment. So, ever since leaving um, EFC and um, my other church, um, at the moment I work as a chaplain at Tungabi Christian College three days a week. Um, I've been working at Excelsior College at Macquarie Park, which is a lecturing job, and I'm lecturing in an early childhood degree. And so, um, so I'm teaching four subjects there, there in terms of sort of biblical sort of foundational subjects. And so um, I'm really enjoying that. And it's, it's funny because uh, the people that I'm teaching are predominantly from Nepal and uh, a lot of them are Hindu, but I'm teaching them the gospel. I'm teaching Christian stuff uh, every day, every week uh, in lectures. Um, so that's two days this term. And then the other thing I do is work at Crusaders at Golston Gorge as a guest liaison officer. And uh, that's sort of like once or twice a month and sort of greet church groups and church uh, school groups in and uh, really enjoy that too. So a few hats and then um, on the side because you can, <laughs> um, I'm doing a, a studying a master of teaching at the moment in secondary and so I'm about halfway through that. Um, last year, or oh, sorry, last year, in 2020, because um, there weren't many jobs around, uh, Tammy she said, oh, maybe you need to be retrained. And so I thought, oh, I don't really want to study anymore. But anyway, I decided to do teaching and I'm doing that at Excelsior College as well. Right. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's uh, fascinating sort of stuff. Um, just going off the uh, Toongabi Christian College, uh, did you find that was uh, on and off because of uh, COVID last year? Yeah, I guess um, during the lockdown period, I think, I was allowed to go on because I was an essential worker, mm. but then because the case numbers got higher, I think they said, okay, all staff, unless you really need to be there, you need to work from home. So I had to work from home, I think, for about six or seven weeks during term three or so. And so that was different. It was hard, but it was different. And so, but I, I guess it was a blessing in disguise because um, normally I meet with um, students and teachers face to face. Yep. But I guess I couldn't do that online because of um, um, child protection issues and that sort of thing. So, but one of the things I was asked to do was contact the parents of their children oh. in the school. So we had a list of all these um, parents to ring. And so I've never met them. And it was good to just connect with them and um, pray with them as well. But mm. being a Christian school, as a chaplain, I could pray with them. So that was a great blessing as well. But, uh, yeah, it was hard. But... Um, I think it was a blessing in disguise as well. Right, yeah. Mm. And what's your thoughts about uh, the coming school year? Is that um, you, you're confident with uh, things going forward or, and schools keeping you updated with uh, their plans and in light of, uh, uh, yeah, still Omicron being around? And yeah, I guess um, I think our principal at our school, he's still waiting for the Premier to actually say what's he actually doing. And I think the update will be next week during our professional development week. So um, I think with a lot of schools, I think they're all planned to go back. Yep. But on the other hand, you know, are they going to do rats? And A bit of, yeah, all those sorts wait of things. And see. But, yeah. uh, but I think we're planned to go back. Mm. Um, we have professional development for the staff this coming week. Mm. And it was all going to be live, face to face, but there's some things that are online. Oh. So bit half-half sort of thing but I think um, yeah I'm looking forward to the year um, mm. connecting with some of the students and staff again. Mm, excellent mm. that's great and so it was going into the Master of Teaching that then opened up a few other opportunities such as teaching at Excel Excelsior. Mm. Uh, was that like kind of unexpected for you uh, some uh, kind of new doors opening? Yeah yeah so as I said I'm um, studying a Master of Teaching but then the head of uh, the Department of Education, he, I think he just rang me or emailed me out of the blue and all of a sudden um, he, sa he asked me, would you like to do some lecturing? And I thought, oh, okay. <laughs> um, one was in a subject which was integrative studies, which is basically um, teaching worldview, ethics and um, the gospel really to students um, uh, and a Christian education subject. So 
I thought, mm, I hesitated for a moment, but I thought, mm, okay, I'll go through it. So that was two subjects, and then it went to three, then to four. But I think uh, I've really enjoyed that, as I mentioned before, mm. and I think um, being able to share the gospel to these predominantly, um, what is it, Hindu, chic sort of students who right. don't know Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. So they've come to the college knowing it's a Christian college, uh, but yeah, they're obviously not Christian, but mm. do you find that they're quite open to, well, okay, look, this is a Christian college, I'm mm. not a Christian, but you're going to uh, mention Christianity, that's kind of expected. Well, it's funny, John, because um, <laughs> what I do in the class, uh, I ask them, you know, why did you decide to study Excelsior College because it's a Christian college? Yeah. And I go around the room, and it's funny because most of the students go, oh, I didn't realise it was a Christian <laughs> college. <laughs> and that was the first time I, they actually hear it. And so, um, so that's really funny. And, and I think a minority sort of going, why are we doing this Christian stuff for, you know, oh. I, can, I didn't sign up for that. But I think the majority actually are receptive to it. Mm. And uh, one girl, I think, she was a Korean. She wasn't a Christian, but she was interested in finding out more about Jesus. And she actually logged in on our church's, our own church's um, uh, live stream mm. during lockdown last year. I think uh, there was another gentleman who was a, a Muslim, I think, and he was asking all these hard questions. And it's all right. online, it's all mm. recorded as well. Yes. So that was really good as well, and everyone else is hearing the answers. So, mm. um, But I think a lot of the late, majority of ladies there, um, actually keen to find out more and mm. who knows what's going to happen like just sowing seeds and mm. being a Christian uh, institution all their subjects have some sort of Christian element to it sure. <laughs> I'm benign to them <laughs> yes yeah. yes so they, uh, they yeah. either didn't read the signs or the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, but it's not as if you're making them it's the fact that this is a Christian college and there's Christian content and there's no shying away from that but you're mm. also like it's not that they have they have to, uh, yeah, uh, do oh, anything yeah. that they, they don't want to do. Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's, that's the right. important thing, yeah. Like it's interesting in the, the course I, one of the courses I teach is uh, integrated studies. Uh, it starts off with other religions, other world views, mm. and that sort of hones in on looking at Christianity. Mm -hmm. and then we look at how to read the Bible, what the gospel yeah. is. Um, so it just sort of hones in on Christianity. And you think, well, I'm teaching these, um, these students how to read the Bible. And so... I think now a lot of them would have never read the Bible before, mm. and so uh, we watch. Um, we go through Luke's Gospel, the whole of Luke's Gospel, during right. the twelve weeks, so two chapters a week, and they have heaps of great questions. And Excellent. yeah, so but but I guess who knows what will happen in the future? God mm. will work in their hearts. So. Yeah. Well, it sounds like a wonderful way in which God has opened up things for you, like uh, the course, but then the teaching, and then yeah, basically having us great opportunity to share Jesus with mm. yeah, people who might not have been, well, who are not following him, but then might not have been expect. well, this is a, this is a great, uh, yeah, open door mm -hmm. for them. So that's mm -hmm. uh, oh, fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so your, um, your new home church is Parramatta Baptist. And uh, what's that been like for you and the family? Is it, uh, you've had a combination of uh, online as well as being there yep. physically? Yeah. Yeah. So we actually um, started going to Paramount Baptist mainly because uh, there was a colleague from Tammy School who goes there and you might know Johan Linda who yep. used to be the head of OMF, OMF in yep. Australia. Mm. Uh, they both go there and I thought, oh, okay, we'll check it out online. And so we did and thought, okay, it sounds all right. And so when, um, when was it, whenever, it was 2020 when the doors opened, uh, we went along and we went to an evening service and... I think we were just taken back after service. Um, all these uh, youth leaders or young adults sort of swarmed Sam and Maddie, our two kids, mm. and we thought, well, and they were just really embracing and welcoming. And uh, so we've been sort of obviously going live and on yep. um, online as well. Um, we've joined a small group as well and mm. that sort of thing. But uh, yeah, really enjoyed. Um, obviously, it's a big, ch bigger church than this, but uh, it has been helpful just to get to know those um, 10 or so adults in our small group. Yep. So, yeah, really enjoyed that. Fantastic. That's great. Um, what can we pray for you? Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, I guess I in terms of those things, um, I guess praying that are good priorities in terms of 
balancing um, our jobs, but also family time as well, time with Tammy as well. And uh, I guess starting off the new year, you know, with um, sort of the anxieties about school and Sam and Maddie going to school, um, I guess just that transition back to school and everything will go smoothly and I guess the virus will sort of, sort of dissipate hopefully over time. Yep, mm. absolutely. Uh, let me lead us in prayer right now. Thanks, John. Heavenly Father, we praise you for uh, this sharing with Dave. Uh, thank you that you've opened up um, some great new opportunities for him to serve you in your kingdom work. Uh, we thank you for the masters of teaching, even if it was different from what Dave has expected. This uh, open door has come with Excelsior College. I uh, thank you he's had this uh, great new challenge of teaching adults, as well as teaching people who are not necessarily from a Christian background. Uh, thank you he's been able to uh, teach Christ as part of the requirements. And uh, thank you that uh, people have been receptive to ask questions and learn. And pray that you will be at work uh, in that class, that they will learn from uh, Dave's uh, witness and sharing as a Christian, as well as the content. I pray that this may be uh, a time when your spirit draws people towards yourself uh, who are yet to know you, uh, but you have brought them here and this opportunity to uh, consider Christ. Uh, so we uh, pray that uh, you will uh, be with Dave and the family in uh, juggling various things, especially in the going back to school, that you would uh, kindly uh, protect children and families uh, at Toon Gabby Christian School, but also all schools going back, uh, that there might be assurance from for parents, for teachers, for children, students. Uh, we pray that uh, plans will be wise and prudent. Uh, we pray that Dave will be able to juggle his different roles, uh, that they would uh, give him variety and great joy, as well as he will meet his requirements and serve well, uh, whether it's at uh, Toongabi Christian School, at uh, Excelsior College, at uh, Crusaders, uh, that you will be with him. P please give them a uh, blessed family time where they can uh, enjoy uh, each other and worship you. Uh, pray that uh, their fellowship at Paramount Baptist might be enriching and uplifting for them, where they would uh, uh, be ministered to as well as they would minister as well. I pray for Sam and Maddie with their return to school as well, that uh, you will be with them. Uh, please grant them resilience uh, that uh, in the various ups and downs and challenges that uh, Omicron is bringing, that uh, you would uh, give them strength. Uh, we do pray for the situation uh, in our city and state, uh, that you would uh, uh, mercifully allow things to abate so uh, normal life and ministry can resume. And so uh, we commit these things to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Dave will be back for the sermon. Now is the time for announcements and then prayers. Uh, very briefly, the uh, online church will continue for the rest of January and uh, then uh, Deacon's Board will review for February uh, whether church uh, will be physically back uh, here or will continue to uh, live stream from church. Uh, so do pray for that and remember that uh, as we uh, have in mind people's health and safety as well as the current situation in society. I'll just grab my phone for the next announcement. Now, an uh, exciting initiative in February is that uh, Ernie and Michelle, our young, will be offering a monthly marriage course. So that's going to be starting uh, on Thursday, the 24th of February. That's going to run over Zoom currently. Uh, it's a seven-session course, and it's based on the materials from Alpha. And so they're going to, uh, the course will involve watching uh, video portions together, completing uh, the book activities as individual couples. And it's a great time of thinking how to strengthen marriage for Christian and unbelieving couples. And uh, so if you're interested or even want to just find out more, then uh, get in touch with uh, Ernie. And uh, he's got his uh, email e.au yearn at live.com.au. So uh, please let him know by 6th of February. But before then, you can also uh, direct some inquiries to him to find out more if that's actually going to be for you. So that's uh, exciting that they're doing that and a great opportunity on such a vital area. 
Well, now we come to a time of prayers. So I'm going to be uh, giving thanks for Australia Day, which is coming up this Wednesday. Praying for our link missionaries, Jason and High Wind Tam. Uh, praying for the sick and the needy, as well as, of course, our church, EFCA. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we praise you for Australia Day, January 26th, coming up this Wednesday. Uh, we give you thanks for the peace and prosperity that we enjoy and that you have brought so many people here over the years to uh, enjoy life in Australia with the bountiful goodness that you have provided. And yet, Father, even, the, e even with all these benefits of modern Australia, we are aware that uh, Australia has a dark past, especially when it comes to regard to ind Indigenous people. And January 26 is at times a date of controversy uh, for the celebration of modern Australia and yet the difficulties that have come because of the treatment of our Indigenous people. We pray indeed, Lord, that uh, we would celebrate and give thanks as well as we would remember the history and there would indeed be forgiveness, reconciliation, healing going forward together. And uh, your gospel allows us to balance both. There is uh, sin which is real and there is forgiveness that comes from you as well as there is healing and reconciliation and repentance. And we pray that you would allow Australians to recognise these things politically and historically but also spiritually as we uh, turn to you, uh, the God of the nations and the God of our nation. Uh, for these great things in our country, but also spiritually with you. Uh, we pray that uh, you would draw Australians to come to know you and that they might have not only the citizenship of Australia, but the citizenship of heaven. Father, we thank you that uh, you are the one who uh, is fatherly in goodness and cares for the sick and the needy. We give you thanks for our dear sister Christy who has just returned home after being in hospital and pray that you would give her great healing and uh, a stability in health so that she might have joy and might continue a normal life. We pray also for Stephen, Winnie and Joshua as they support each other and support her. We also pause now to pray for those who are known to us, who are on our hearts. Comfort and heal, merciful Lord, those who are in sickness, sorrow, trouble or difficulty. May they know of your everlasting love in Christ that nothing can take away. May they have timely answers to prayers that they can see from your hand, whether it's the right treatment, intervention, healing, fellowship, affection, a sense of your presence, a timely word. May they grow in trust in you as we do as well. We pray particularly for those uh, who are affected by COVID, that you might allow mercifully uh, swift healing and recovery and also the right treatment for those who require it. We pray also for our government and our authorities and health professionals that as they continue to uh, make decisions, as they continue to uh, uh, provide treatment and advice, that you would give them such wisdom, strength, the ability to listen carefully, the energy that they require to uh, do all those things in the service of others. We pray that they would uh, also have a sense of dependence on you, and they would turn to you in faith. Father, we also give you thanks for our church. Uh, we thank you that uh, we are able to ha uh, continue fellowship because of the technology that you have provided. We pray as well that you would uh, be with each of our congregations, with English, Cantonese and Mandarin at uh, EFCA uh, over these January Sundays. We pray that fellowship might continue occurring today uh, via live stream and we pray that uh, you would be with our deacon board as well as they continue the 
decisions about February services, that they would uh, be wise and prudent and uh, continue to have in mind people's health and safety and yet confidence in you and the importance of physical fellowship as you have made us to be face to face with one another. So we realise this is our priority as balanced with health and safety as well. And finally, we uh, pray for our link missionaries, Jason and Hai Win Tam, who were in Taiwan and yet uh, in Australia until September of this year. We give you thanks for the report of 98% of their financial support provided. We thank you that that is a relief to them without excessive worry or stress. Uh, we pray that for Jason to continue using his gifts. Thank you for his work in psychology to keep up his registration. We pray for OMF as well, that in these uh, COVID-disrupted times that you would be with them, that they might think uh, boldly about how uh, the message of Jesus will go forth and also how it will do so in these uh, challenging circumstances. We pray for the situation of Taiwan with all the tension with uh, Taiwan and China. We pray that uh, you would uh, be with the people of Taiwan, that uh, they would also turn to you, knowing that you are the Prince of Peace, you are the God of the nations. And whatever their circumstances bring, that they would uh, look to you. Pray that they, you would banish the spirit that makes for war and instead uh, direct people to a harmony, to a peace which will suit all people. We do pray for their co-workers, Joseph and Olivia, for their second daughter, Oghap, particularly, to recover from COVID as she's in Thailand. Uh, we pray that you would uh, mercifully uh, provide for them and uh, that you would enable them to be your instruments uh, for your kingdom in the place that you have brought them. So, our Father, we commit all these things to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now is our time from hearing from the Word of God. So Francis is going to bring us uh, the Bible reading by video and then uh, we have Dave to uh, give us the sermon on Psalm 44. Good morning, church. Today's Bible reading comes from Psalm chapter 44. For the director of music of the sons of Korah, a masculine. We have heard it with our ears, O God, our ancestors have told us what you did in their days in days long ago. With your hand you drove out the nations and planted our ancestors. You crushed the peoples and made our ancestors flourish. It was not by their soul that they won the land, nor did their arm bring them victory. It was your right hand, your arm and the light of your face, for you love them. You are my King and my God, who decrees victories for Jacob. Through you we push back our enemies. Through your name we trample our foes. I put no trust in my bow. My sword does not bring me victory. For you give us victory over our enemies. You put our adversaries to shame. In God we make our boasts all day long, and we praise your name forever. But now you have rejected and humbled us. You no longer go out with our armies. You made us retreat before the enemy, and our adversaries have plundered us. You gave us up to be devoured like sheep and have scattered us among the nations. You sold your people for pittance, gaining nothing from their sale. You have made us a reproach to our neighbors, the scorn and derision of those around us. You have made us a byword among the nations, the people shake their heads at us. I live in disgrace all day long, and my face is covered with shame at the taunts of those who reproach and devour me because of the enemy who is bent on revenge. All these came upon us. Though we had not forgotten you, we had not been false to your covenant. Our hearts had not turned back. Our feet have not, had not strayed from your path. But you crushed us and made us a haunt for jackals. You covered us over with deep darkness. If we had forgotten the name of our God or spread out our hands to a foreign God, would not God have discovered it since he knows the secrets of the heart? Yet for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Awake, Lord, 
why do you sleep? Rouse yourself, do not reject us forever. Why do you hide your face and forget our misery and oppression? We are brought down to the dust, our bodies cling to the ground. Rise up and help us, rescue us because of your unfailing love. That's the end. The COVID-19 pandemic is sure shaking us up, hasn't it? Whether you're someone who's had the virus, know someone who has, or know someone who tragically has died from the virus. Whether you're a close or casual contact being forced into isolation, whether it's the endless lockdowns, the check-ins, the homeschooling, the government mandates, and the crowd restrictions. Whether it's the constant border closures and not being able to travel interstate or overseas to see your loved ones. We've all been affected by the virus. Over the past couple of years, Australians have had it tough, from the extremes of drought and bushfires to floods and now the pandemic. So many lives have been lost. So many communities have been devastated. Whole communities are in mourning and our nation grieves with them. Intense suffering like this can shatter us and lead us to a deep sadness, despair, and to anger. And understandably, people cry out, why? Why? Why are there such pointless and terrible losses inflicted on us? And I'm sure that many Australians too have paused to ask, why? And perhaps they even further ask, why would such a good God allow such tragedies? Well, in Psalm 44, the nation of Israel is in a similar predicament. God's people, too, are suffering. And so as we, as we explore their suffering as a nation, what can we as a nation, as a fellowship of believers, learn from Israel's response to their suffering? So before we go into Psalm 44, let's pray together. So will you join me in prayer? Father, if we pray now as we come to your word, we pray that you'll quiet our hearts. Please speak to each one of us, change our hearts and our minds to live lives that are honest, to live lives uh, pleasing and glorifying to you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And so there's four points today. The first point is the previous victories. First point, the previous victories. Uh, in this psalm, the people of God praise God and remember the work that he's done in the past. If you have your Bibles there, Psalm 44, looking at verse 2. It says, With your hand you drove out the nations and planted our ancestors. You crushed the peoples and made our ancestors flourish. It was not by their sword that they won the land, nor did their arm bring them victory. It was your right hand your arm in the light of your face, for you loved them. The psalmist reflects on a time when God's people had conquered the land, the land that God had promised them. The psalmist tells of God's great power and how he provided for them over the centuries. And in verse 2, it states that God alone has driven out the nations. God's the one that planted and placed the ancestors in the land. It's God who mightily crushed the people in Canaan. And as a result, their ancestors flourished. You see, it wasn't by their own cleverness, their skills, or even their weaponry that they were able to achieve all these victories. But it was God alone. God was the one that provided for them and brought about these victories. And so the psalmist declares in verse 4, You are my king and my God who decrees victories for Jacob. Even in verse 5, it's God who enabled them to push back their enemies and to trample their foes. And in verse 7, it's God who gives them the victory over their enemies and puts their adversaries to shame. And because of this, in verse 8, their boast is in God alone. God is the one, the object of their praise. And so for God's people... Things are cruising along quite well. 
But then circumstances begin to change and God's people begin to suffer. And this goes on to my second point, their present sufferings. You know, the dreams and the aspirations of this nation of Israel were being fulfilled, overthrowing the enemies, trampling their foes, putting their adversaries to shame. And it was all because God was with them. And then it comes to an abrupt halt with a three-letter word, but. Have a look at me in verse 9. But now you have rejected and humbled us. You no longer go out with our armies. You made us a retreat before the enemy. And our adversaries have plundered us. You gave us up to be, to be devoured like sheep and have scattered us among the nations. You sold your people for a pittance, gaining nothing from their sale. It appears now that all of a sudden that God's abandoned his chosen people. Despite all the victories, the overthrowing of their enemies, it seems like God has left them. And so with harsh and pointed language, the psalmist leaves no doubt that the cause of Israel's suffering and disgrace is God himself. In verses 9 to 14, the psalmist emphasises this by the constant use of the word you. You have rejected and humbled us. You no longer go out. You made us a retreat. You gave us up. You sold your people. You made us a reproach to our neighbours. You have made us a byword among the nations. You see, the psalmist accuses God. He solely declares that God alone is responsible for their ruin, their taunting, their mocking, and his rejection of them. As we pause to look at our own nation, the past couple of years could be summarised in the word loss. Loss of freedom, loss of security, loss of mental health, loss of jobs, loss of possessions, loss of communities, loss of time, and not to mention the loss of precious loved ones. And similarly, for the nation of Israel, the people are grieving their loss. And they attribute this all to none other than God himself. The psalmist is in anguish, pleading their innocence as a nation to God. And this goes on to my third point, where they plead, they protest for their innocence. Here in verses 17 to 21, the psalmist speaks for the nation of Israel. He protests, he appeals to God on the grounds that they're innocent, they're totally innocent. The psalmist declares that they've done nothing wrong to warrant the suffering that God is permitting them to go through. And he questions repeatedly, have the people betrayed God? No. Have the people worshipped other gods? No. Have they been unfaithful to the covenant and God's laws? No. You see, in the eyes of the nation of Israel, they have done nothing wrong. And this sees them boldly protest against God, with them pleading their innocence. In verse 17, they reiterate, they haven't forgotten God. They haven't been false to the covenant. And in verse 18, they declare that their hearts haven't turned back and haven't moved away from him. They emphasize that they have, in fact, walked closely and abided by God's law. You see, they're shaking their heads in wonder as to why they're being afflicted so much with this suffering. And the psalmist declares once again in verse 19 that God's the one who's crushed them. And now they find themselves at the mercy of the vultures longing to devour them. Darkness has surrounded them, like being trapped in a cave where it's so dark that you can't even see your own hand if it waved in front of you. If the Israelites had sinned against God, then they acknowledge that it will make perfect sense that they deserve all of this suffering. But no, they've remained loyal to God. They've remained loyal to the covenant. And they determine that they deserve to be protected by God, not abandoned by him. Again in verse 20, they appeal that they haven't forgotten about God, nor have rejected him, nor have they bowed down to foreign idols. 
and they declare that God is their witness. Surely he knows their hearts. Surely he knows their innocence. And so as a result, the psalmist pleads with God for their deliverance. And this goes on to my final point, their plea for deliverance. Have a look with me in verse 23. The psalmist says these words, Awake, Lord, why do you sleep? Arouse yourself. Do not reject us forever. Why do you hide your face and forget our misery and oppression? We are brought down to the dust. Our bodies cling to the ground. Rise up and help us. Rescue us because of your unfailing love. You see, the psalmist is on his hands and his knees. He's pleading with God for their deliverance. And he wants God to act. Wake up. Do something. Do anything. However, we're reminded in Psalm 121 verse 3 that we know that God, our God, isn't a God who sleeps and slumbers. It says, he will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The psalmist isn't saying that God needs to have a snooze, has a sleep, because he's exhausted from looking after the world. No, rather, it seems to him that God's inactive, that he's not doing anything to get them out of this dire situation. But we need to be assured that God, our God, is actively sustaining his world by his powerful word. In verse 24 to 25, they are brought down to the dust. Their bodies cling to the ground. And they're nearly given up all hope. They're prostrate, wasting away. They're exhausted on the verge of dying. And so with one desperate plea, they cry out in verse 26, Rise up! Help us! Rescue us! Because of your unfailing love. Why should God awaken and rise up? Well, the psalmist appeals to God's character, to his unfailing love to his people. They firmly hold to the covenantal promises of Exodus 19, where God promised to be their God, and they will be their people. And so they wait in hope for God to respond earnestly desiring him to remember his commitment to his people. Now for each one of us here, there may have been times when you've experienced the silence from God. Perhaps in your suffering you've cried out, Where are you, God? Where are you? Why has all this hardship and suffering come upon me, my family? Perhaps this is your cry to God today and you're longing to know God's closeness. And if this is where you're at, can I encourage you to keep being assured of God's love for you, even though you may struggle to make sense of it all. But you might ask yourself, how? I mean, how does God show his love to me? How can I hold on to this? Well, though at times we desire to hear this audible voice from God, we don't need a voice that comes out of the storm. But what we need to realise is that Jesus bowed his head in the greatest storm. And this happened when he willingly went to the cross to die for your sin, my sin, the sin of the world, so that God could bring us into relationship with him to accept us. You see, Jesus was totally innocent. He did nothing wrong and yet was accused. He was rejected by men. Jesus was homeless, lonely, abandoned by his friends, stripped naked, whipped in terrible agony as he hung there on the cross to die. You see, God understands, he feels the pain because he himself suffered and experienced the first hand. He alone was truly innocent. He alone was completely abandoned. 
And so he completely knows our pain and also the extensive pain that our nation goes through right now. And so when suffering comes upon your life and you feel absolutely overwhelmed, remember Jesus Christ. Choose to fix your eyes on him because he is the source of hope. He walked the ultimate path of suffering. And so take comfort in knowing that he knows what it means to suffer. From Psalm 44 today, not only have we been reminded of the Israelite suffering, but this psalm gives us permission, permission to be real with God about how we're feeling, to plead and to protest our case for deliverance for ourselves, for God's people, for our nation, and to ask questions, to reflect on our own faithfulness. Although we know in our heads that God has achieved a great victory over sin and death on the cross, there may be times when we feel that God's distant, he's far away, he's somewhat forgotten us. And maybe as a nation we have felt that God has done nothing during this previous crisis of drought and bushfires and even during COVID. And yet in such seasons, despite being that feeling, that crushed feeling and experiencing hardship, we as the people of God can find that source of comfort, that source of strength, In the words of Paul in Romans chapter 8, he says this, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it's written, for all your sake, we face death all day long. We consider their sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels or demons, neither the present or the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, for those of us here who believe in Jesus, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. There's nothing in all of creation that can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so in the moments of suffering, we might be tempted to vent our rage, seek revenge, or maybe play the victim. But this psalm encourages us to share our pain, our anguish with our Heavenly Father. Furthermore, the psalmist also reminds us of the tremendous opportunity that we have to allow God to transform our pain into that opportunity to glorify God. We can choose to respond to our suffering that we would never choose to allow others to come into relationship with God. Despite all the bushfires, the drought and now COVID, there remains hope amidst the crisis. Though hard to imagine now, it will be like a new growth that will flourish, it will bloom from the charred remains. And so for us as God's people, though for a little while we might have to suffer, grieve and experience hardship, these have come so that our faith of greater worth than gold may be proved genuine and may result in praise and glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although we don't see him now, we love him. And even though we don't see him now, we believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for we will receive the goal of our faith, the salvation of our souls. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the honesty of the psalmist, although he's going through so much hardship, as the nation of Israel went through that hardship as well, we thank you that we too we can be honest and frank with God, telling him how we feel, the hardships and the feelings and the brokenness and the pain that we go through. 
Father, we pray for ourselves. We pray for our nation. We know there are many who are listening. There are many in our nation who are at the point of breaking, who are in hardship and suffering. Father, we pray for your comfort. We pray for your mercy. We pray for healing. And we pray that through this time of pandemics, we pray, Father, for a breakthrough, for people to look beyond themselves, to look to the hope that we have in the Lord Jesus because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We pray, Father, although we don't see Jesus, we love him. Even though we don't see him now, we believe in you. And when we are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, because one day we will receive the goal of our faith, the salvation of our souls. We pray, come Lord Jesus, come. And we pray in his name. Amen. wrap up uh, we thank uh, Pastor Dave again for uh, bring, uh, coming and uh, bringing us the message 
And it was very apt, wasn't it, how Psalm 44 is taken up by the Apostle Paul in our Romans 8. The assurance that in the difficulties and trials that there is nothing that separates us from the love of God. God's love is constant uh, even amongst the various challenges that we face and we can be real with him as we have said and the Psalms help us to do so. Well, let's uh, end with uh, words of blessing from Hebrews 13, verses 20 and 21. Now may the God of peace, who brought back, brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good, that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, may God bless you. And uh, we will uh, see you again during the week uh, as well as next Sunday. Amen.